YouTube, on Twitter and Periscope, and on Facebook. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Patrick. I work at the Aquarium in Social Media, and you can actually see me now on the screen. I'm waving over here, and joining me, we've got Emily, who's right down here, and we've got Kelsey, who's right over here. Hey, Emily. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Patrick. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Oh, it's going. Hi, everybody. Fantastic. Look at this little bit of technology that we have going on right now. We <laughs> finally figured out how to have all of us here on screen. I'll actually <laughs> remove our icons here really quick. So uh, again, I'm Patrick. This is Emily down here. She's got the kelp in the background and we've got Kelsey over here on the side. And we are going to be chatting about what's behind us here in the background, which is the kelp forest exhibit. We've done this once before. We've talked to Kelsey before uh, about the kelp forest exhibit and we are here for your questions. Emily is looking closely at all of the folks that are tuning in right now. And Kelsey, uh, we will get started maybe with you just very quickly. Uh, can you tell us uh, what is going on here with this uh, webcam that we have going on in the background? What are we looking at there? So at the moment, I actually can't see the webcam. Oh, okay. Well, we're so looking at the Kelp Forest exhibit. We're good. But if we're looking at the Kelp Forest exhibit, yeah. uh, sure I, figure, I figure we've got some uh, kelp swaying pretty nicely. We've got some fish going in there. Uh, I know that we did our feeds earlier today, so fish should be nice and happy and, and well fed and just kind of cruising the exhibit. All right. Yeah. And right now we've got uh, we've got some senorita. Oh, we just zoomed out. There we go. We just zoomed out here. We're looking at the large exhibit there, the big windows. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your job uh, working uh, at the aquarium, taking care of these animals there? So me personally, I'm a senior aquarist. I'm in charge of the Kelp Forest team. So I'm in charge of the team of aquarists that um, that all take care of the exhibit. Uh, we do everything from cleaning to uh, feeding and all of that. And especially since we haven't been able to have any volunteer divers on, uh, we've had to clean a lot more. We miss you. I know it's been said before, but I'll say it again. We miss our volunteers very much. Absolutely. Um, so if everybody wants to comment on how clean the windows are, I've did multiple dives this week to make sure that that would happen. So that's all because of me of course yeah those yeah. those windows looked good there kelsey i'm putting up the a selfie there of you with the giant sea bass that we uh <laughs> played previously there um so that is uh besides you know taking taking selfies with with giant sea bass cleaning the windows uh taking care of the organisms uh in that exhibit can you tell us a little bit uh for the folks that might be tuning in of how one gets into uh this type of of profession that you have well, I've always loved animals ever since I was little, and I've always been um, a big science buff too. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, actually pretty close to the Puget Sound. So a lot of times I could be found tide pooling, exploring the shores on my belly at, at docks, poking at animals, especially anemones. As a kid, I liked watching them curl up on themselves. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've worked with animals since I was little. Uh, got really into science. I have a degree in zoology. And then after college, I got an internship at an aquarium uh, up in Tacoma, Washington for Point Defiance. And that was also when I started scuba diving and I just fell in love with everything scuba diving, everything underwater more than I already had. And uh, yeah, and I got a job about a year later at Monterey and I've been here ooh, almost 11 years now. That's awesome. And uh, Kelsey, I don't know if you've noticed uh, yet, if you're looking at the stream, but we did rename you to Kelpsy. Am I Kelpsy? You are Kelpsy. <laughs> yes, your your logo is Kelpsy indeed for this particular I, live stream. We did it. I have to say I've, about half of my emails lately, I've been addressed to Kelpsy. So I'm yes. liking everything. Wonderful. We, we made it happen. I'm going to head over, uh, switch over to Emily. Emily, what can you tell us uh, from the folks here? Um, what kind of questions are we getting there from everybody? Well, first of all, people are just delighted by the fact that we have changed it to Kelp C <laughs> <over there. laughs> for your little icon. Um, some of people just saying hello from all over the world right now, tuning in. Um, one question that I did see you go by here, Kelsey, what's your, do you have a particular favorite animal to take care of at the aquarium inside the kelp forest? 
I've got a cup. Well, a couple of favorites. Uh, one of my favorites. I've always loved wolf eels. Uh, they've always been one of my favorite animals to take care of. And uh, we've got three in kelp forest right now, and they're really fun to come out and feed. It's also fun to get to know their different personalities. We've got a younger male in there that likes coming out and getting his uh, chin scratched from the divers. Patrick, I'm sure you could attest to that. Yep. I know that you feed in there. Um, I've also had a good time taking care of our giant sea bass and instituting a training program for them uh, where they are coming to targets to get their food. And that's been a really fun experience. So I like taking care of those guys too. If I had to choose my favorites, that's like choosing your favorite kid. That's really hard to do. That's awesome. Uh, if you'd like Kelsey, I can, um, I can see about pulling up here the, the video there of the, of the wolf eels. Let's see. Oh, if, yeah. Let's see if I can find it here in time. Yes. Here we go. All right. I've got this video just about ready to go almost there and let's see there we go what can you tell us about uh our little wolfy friend here who's on screen so those two are a male and female which is part of what we're assuming based off of their facial structure and they live in a little cave you can see them both coming out of their uh, crevice there and uh, yeah, they're really fun to feed. They've got very powerful jaws that are made to crush through urchins, um, crab shells, all sorts of hard shells. So we are careful not to get our fingers in there because I think the wolf eel would come out best. Um, yeah, and they're fun animals to, to feed. They are a little, uh, oh, not the stealthiest of animals. So sometimes we've got to make sure that that food is right in front of their face for them to get it. But we also do try to feed them. Like I think you guys saw a shrimp on there. Uh, that's really good to feed them anything with the shells because it keeps their teeth nice and sharp. Awesome. Well, there we go. Yeah, we, we see the shrimp there going directly into the to the wolf field there. So glad we could bring uh, one of the favorites up there on screen. Let's see. We'll transition away from that and we'll go over to Emily. Emily, what else are folks wondering Hi. out there? <laughs> Um, I actually saw a great question over on Facebook, Kelsey, and it really has to do with the kelp and not the animals yeah. inside. Um, kelp happens to be a very, very fast growing algae. What do we do to kind of keep it in check? Do we trim it? And if we trim it, what happens to those trimmings afterwards? So we normally try to, uh, we, we let it grow in kelp forests and it does really well because we do get natural seawater in, we do get natural sunlight, we've got wave motion going on that you guys can see that mesmerizing wave going across the screen. But one of the things that does happen is over a year or so, uh, the hold fast is good for about seven to eight years and we'll keep on sp spawning off new kelp fronds. But if there's any ones that are a little raggedy or have lost their, um, their fronds, we can actually cut them underwater and we can either bring down uh, scissors or knives or you can bend them in half. And especially if you've got a fingernail or something, you could do a little nick, they actually snap in half pretty well. And then the leftover kelp that we pull out, the older stuff gets dispersed to all sorts of areas in, um, in the aquarium. So it goes to touch pools, depending on how much we have, it goes to a lot of the exhibits in kelp zone in Rocky Shores. And also depending on how much we have our sea otters like getting it, especially the Sorax sea otters, uh, they can play around in it. Um, and it's, it's good enrichment for them, although they do destroy it pretty quickly. So, but we like giving them that shot when we can. Um, an interesting thing about this that not everybody has, and one of the reasons this kelp force is so good is we do actually have kelp growing in there on its own too. Sometimes it grows uh, up against the wall, up against the back wall, and what we'll do is we'll actually transplant that. So we'll go in, I've got a big serrated knife that people kind of make fun of me of when I'm holding it because it looks a little scary. Um, but you go and you can take the whole hold fast off of the back wall and then you attach it to a weight. Um, there's different ways to do it. The way I've liked doing it is attaching it to a weight and then you lower it down on top of one of those reefs. And then the hold fast, the haptera, like the little tendrils are going to grow over 
and space out. And so then that holdfast is gonna attach to the rock work we have in there. And the kelp is gonna grow up nice and big and tall as well. So we're kind of, we're taking care of some of the older pieces and then new ones that appear, we're taking care of those guys too. Awesome. Awesome. All right, yeah, back, back over to you, Emily. All right. Um, we were just talking about the wolf eel there. Kelsey, you mentioned that it is not a true eel. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Why is it a true eel? And if it's not, then uh, kind of what else is it more closely related to? Yeah, so true eels, you can always tell, and there's only one in Monterey Bay area. So they only have the one fin that's essentially their dorsal fin that's on top that kind of goes along the top and wraps around the bottom. So if you look in the video, these guys have got pectoral fins behind their head, one on each side. That means it's a fish, not an eel. However, whoever named it originally way back when saw a really long skinny thing and called it an eel. So that's how those have stayed. Uh, it's the same thing with monkey face eels that we have. They're not actually a true eel. They've got, because they've got those pectoral fins right there. The only true eel that you can sometimes find in Monterey, it's normally a little too cold up here, but you've been able to find them, and especially lately as the waters have been warming, is a California moray eel. So if you look at that one, it just has got the continuous one fin around the top of the body. There awesome. you go. Great. Back to you, Emily. I uh, so many questions coming in right now. We love it. We love seeing all the engagement across the platforms again. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, for those who, of you who are just joining us, my name is Emily. I'm part of the social media team here at the Aquarium. We've got Patrick and Kelsey joining us today. Patrick's on social media with me. We've got the amazing Kelp C, uh, one of our aquarists at the aquarium, taking care of our kelp horse and all the animals, all the critters that we love there. Um, she's here helping us talk about the kelp forest, answer all your questions this afternoon. Um, and I think that we answered this one a little bit before uh, about uh, the kelp inside of the kelp forest. It's not the original kelp that we opened with, that these are generations and generations of kelp over time. Right, Kelsey? Yes, multiple generations throughout time. Uh, we usually do try to add at least one new kelp plant from the wild every year just to increase the genetic diversity. Um, usually I've gotten those the past couple of years on beach rack, which is if you guys have gone to the beach, especially after a storm, you see all that algae that's been washed up, uh, I usually take it from there. Uh, so it is probably their great, 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 great half grandparent. Unfortunately, that's what happens when you've got these guys, but some of the rock fish in there that are very long lived are probably some have been with the aquarium for 36 years. Yeah. Those rockfish are amazing. So for those of you checking out the kelp forest cam right now, um, keep an eye out for some very grumpy looking fish. They have big mouths um, and they tend to just kind of float in one area or sit in one area doing their best impression of a rock. Those are some of the rockfish. I think there are there are like 14 different species of rockfish mm -hmm. fish that we have inside of the kelp forest, right, Kelsey? Yeah, yeah, good job. Yeah, 14 of them. Ooh. Uh, they're also Nailed the it. ones, yeah, <laughs> nice. They're also the ones that we get a lot of calls from concerned guests about because that fish hasn't moved in a while and yeah, it's not going to. It looks like a rock, it stays still like a rock. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> I'll that's, do, that's, that's, that's its life. I'll do my best as well to, uh, to try to point out a rock fish, uh, when we get a good view of it once the camera zooms out here again. Emily, we're, we're there with you. I can also take us away right. and go to a video, uh, but um, any uh, more people questions? People can just or... see me typing away. I'm <laughs> looking down yeah. to see the keys right now. Oh, there um, we go. Sorry, I'll, I'll, take, us, I'll take us no, away. I think we've got some, uh, <laughs> I think we've got some rock fish here in view that I can there point out. So over here, if my drawing works, these ones here oh yeah there we go nice. we've, got, we've got some blue rockfish in there and i believe kelsey we have both different species of what would be considered blue rockfish at the aquarium the deacon and the blue rockfish though they're we or at least we have had all of them but these uh oh i gotta get rid of our icons now because the because <laughs> everybody's crowding over there but i think let's see if i can draw right here 
Yeah, those are our blue rockfish right there. What can you tell us about those rockfish? Um, blue rockfish are a schooling rockfish. So as they demonstrated so well for you, they often stay in schools together. Uh, you also can tell them apart from a lot of different other species because they do have a bit of a shorter head. And if you look underneath their jawline, underneath their operculum, they've got two blue stripes right there. So that's usually pretty indicative of uh, blue rockfish. And there we go. And those blue rockfish are one of those rockfish species that uh, some folks out there may out be catching uh, to feed on themselves, recreational folks. And then there's also black rockfish in the exhibit as well that are also some of the more common tasty ones. But rockfish kind of they they've been called lots of different names right kelsey pacific yeah. red pacific red snapper there's so many species that everyone just kind of lumps them to together keep up on common names for all the fish too yeah. especially when you combine like what people call them when they see them in the wild and what people call them when they see them at a fish store there's yeah. a lot yeah all right back to you emily we all saw right. our rockfish we nailed it okay all right yeah <laughs> got the rockfish questions answered there uh Kelsey, back to a kelp question here. Yeah. Um, people want to know, uh, you know, we just talked a little bit about the differences between fishes and true eels and what's Ooh. going on there with the wolf eels. Kelp, oftentimes they're hearing us call it algae and seaweed. So what are some of those differences between what a seaweed is and algae is and kelp? So seaweed is sometimes an, uh, an all-encompassing common name for underwater algae essentially uh, algae is different from plants because the way plants grow is that they get nutrients from their leaves or blades from the sun um oh sorry i mix, i mixed that up uh, they get nutrients from their roots that go into the leaves algae is opposite they got big broad leaves leaves fronds and that's how they get their energy from and what's at the base is what I referred to earlier as a hold fast, and there's no nutrient exchange going on there. That's pretty much just to keep them cemented and down to the rock. Um, there is some overview, so we do have some underwater plants, but normally those are gonna be higher in the intertidal area because they need a lot more sunlight and they need a lot uh, more to um, to be able to get their nutrients that are in the shallower water. We do have some, it's called uh, surf grass. We do have some in kelp forest exhibit, but it's against the back wall and the kelp has been super thick lately. So you might not be able to see it. Awesome. Gotcha. Um, and then another person here uh, who may have turned to uh, there. Let's try this again. <laughs> <laughs> who may have tuned in uh, to one of our other discussions or yeah. uh, knows about another one of these animals in the kelp forest is curious how is our lobster doing? In oh, there? he's doing great. I just saw him the other day too. <laughs> um, he is the new home seems to be about halfway up above where the that wolf eel pair was. Uh, lobster's doing great. Hanging in there. It's That's huge. Awesome. I took uh, two newer um, aquarium divers in this past week and I usually try to show them like the nooks and crannies and where they all are. And Sometimes the lobster hides for months and we don't see it, but it's finally come out again. And fortunately for both of those two newer divers, I was able to point them out, which is cool because it's a huge lobster. It, yeah, it's now, massive. Now that it's, it's really had its awesome. its moment yeah. back in the sun, we could call it a lobster now of the internet because hey, it's everywhere. Go. We got to get those puns in there somewhere. All right. I, I live for puns. Okay. Kelpsy is here for the puns. Kelpsy is here for the puns. That's the lobster. All right. Back to you, Emily. All right. All right. Taking a look at the comments coming in right now. We did have some people curious. We had some uh, bright orange fish that were in frame there just a moment ago. Um, you want to talk a little bit about them, Kelsey? Yeah, those would be the Garibaldi, which is actually the California state um, saltwater fish. We've got a freshwater fish, too. Uh, and they are they're a very fun animal. Uh, they tend to be very territorial, so as much as I want an entire exhibit full of those guys, we've got to maintain it at a uh, at a reasonable level. But one of the cool things, so in this exhibit, when they're bigger, they're all orange, but these guys are a type of damselfish, so they actually look differently when they're younger. That's so if, uh, as a fish, you know, releases 
or after they hatch, um, the adult fish won't attack. They, they pretty much attack and are territorial with anything that looks like them. So if their baby fish were hatched recently in the area and they look differently, they won't get chased away until they're a little bit older. But when they're young, they're this really pretty orange blue color, more blue than orange. And as they grow up, they lose some of that blue coloration. And when they're like teenagers, they've got these really pretty blue speckled spots. By the time they're big enough to go in a kelp forest, they're that all orange color, which is a very beautiful color too. Uh, but in some of the other exhibits around the aquarium, uh, especially in kelp zone, you'll be able to see them at different life stages and different shades of blue. Awesome. I have uh, right now up on screen there um, a photo of that Garibaldi um, that's in our, our kelp forest exhibit. And then there are also some other orange ones, too, uh, people may have seen of the, the cigar-shaped senorita. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to dive with those, especially because at the moment, the, the senoritas are a little bit more inquisitive of divers going in than, than previous. Yeah, as you probably found out, there's not as many divers going in. Uh, senoritas uh, can actually pick off parasites from other fish. They can be known as cleaners of the sea. And so if something goes in, they usually investigate and they don't have hands to investigate. They've got a little teeny mouth that kind of comes and tries to peck at you, especially if you're diving and you've got any hair outside of you that's like out of your mask, in between your mask and your hood. Uh, they come over and investigate that and sometimes it can hurt. Yeah, here's a here's a photo. You thank you for talking uh, with enough time that I was able to go and find that image there. But there it is up on screen there. Uh, Garibaldi, or sorry, the senorita is coming up and actually pecking at my camera while I was taking a photo. And that those, <laughs> those little beaks there snapping at hair is something that a lot of people feel when they're when they're in there. Cool. All right, we got that up on screen and it's gone. And now we're back to Emily. Hello. What are we thinking? What 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 do the folks want to know out there? We had another great question uh, that just came up over on Facebook, Kelsey, uh, wondering, are, are Pacific spiny lobsters different than New England lobsters? Yes, very different. Uh, they are a different color. And also one of the bigger differences, one of the things that New England Maine lobsters are known for are for their very big claws that uh, a lot of people like to consume. Pacific spiny lobsters have got teeny, teeny little claws that don't look like, they don't look like much more than an extension or you could sometimes mistake them for another pair of legs until you look closely and you can see that there are pinchers in there. Uh, they're sharp pinchers, they're effective, but they're definitely a different shape than what most people typically think of for a lobster with the big claws. Awesome. And uh, I was able to yeah. find here a photo of yours, Emily, actually, I believe, of uh, the lobster molts that oh, we've had yeah. over the years. So there on the to, to the side of you now, Emily, we have that photo there of uh, one lobster, many different wardrobes uh, over time there with those with those lobsters. Nice. Yeah, All that's right. a good photo, Emily. Oh, thanks. No, I shouldn't take credit for any of that work that has uh all then the wonderful people taking care of the lobster in our discovery labs. Uh, that's where that one was was taken in there. Yeah, so you can tell from those photos too, you can't even see their claws because they're so small. They're underneath the carapace. They're teeny little things. There we go. Tiny but effective. Kind of like senoritas. Nice. We're tying it all together. We're getting all of them together. Look at that. <laughs> all right. Back to you, Emily. All right. What do we think? Um, another great question that just came up over on Facebook. Uh, people curious about the kelp. We're just talking about lobsters and how people like to eat the lobsters. But what about the kelp? Do people eat kelp? Yes, people can eat kelp. Um, there, there's actually been a, a boom in people consuming kelp. Um, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as seaweed. Seaweed's kind of all-encompassing for a lot of different species of algae. I do know that there's differences in, al in the types of algae. I've got to say, I've tried several different kinds. I personally am not a fan. Um, you, but you also can break down kelp, uh, and there's properties 
in it uh, that you can find in toothpaste, you can find it in beer, you can find it in a lot of different household items. So even if you're not eating a full kelp blade, you're still consuming kelp in, in some form. Absolutely. And uh, one cool thing too with kelp that I've tried recently that I hadn't uh, hadn't really known much about is um, kelp has a lot of uh, glutamate in it in terms of some of the salts that it has. And so dried kelp uh, can be a really, really delicious broth enhancer. So I uh, definitely recommend to folks out there, if you're looking for kelp products, not only is it very uh, often very abundant and sustainably grown, it can be very, very delicious just to put a dash of kelp in there like you might put extra butter into a sauce to make it that much better a little bit of kelp goes a long way too that's that, i think that's a good motto for life in general a little bit of kelp <laughs> goes a long way i i agree 100 <laughs> especially with this kelp forest that we have here in the background it's true i want more yeah. kelp give me more kelp more kelp, kelp. <laughs> more a kelp. lot of more kelp goes sorry a long way for that's kelp. just me give me more <laughs> that's, always more that seems like kelpsy may have a vested interest in more <laughs> kelp existing interesting <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, the kelp forest still, as always, um, and the amazing animals that we find in there, um, someone was curious, are there any luminescent animals in the kelp forest, oh. fluorescent animals in the kelp forest? Yes. So uh, we do have a swell shark in there, and swell sharks are biofluorescent, so it's not so, so bioluminescence, like down south in San Diego, I've been seeing some incredible videos of at night, these really pretty blue tides from a lot of bioluminescence. Those are animals that produce their own light. A lot of time, if it's biofluorescent, it's not actually something that, like a light that is actively producing, but if you put the right color filters and look at it under a certain type of light, they do glow. So swell sharks are crazy, and we didn't know this until recently, but under the right lights, they actually glow green and they're really bright green. And then their spots are like, you can see the, the, the spots in them too. So we do have a swell shark in there, but she's very cryptic. She don't see her too often. Absolutely. I am uh, furiously loading up that image there, everybody. So if you are, <laughs> yeah. if well, you are you, wondering, I am absolutely tap dance there. Yes. Tap um, dancing behind the scenes here. I'll go back yeah, to well, you, Emily. Tap dance behind the scenes, Patrick. Um, I just wanted to address, we had a couple of uh, teachers tuning in across oh, our good. platforms, um, which is wonderful. Hello, teachers. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing right now. Hello to all your students who may be watching um, either now or in the future. Uh, they were curious if the videos are going to be available afterwards and absolutely so all these videos that we're doing um, will always be archived on facebook youtube twitch and periscope so that they are available for you um, you and your students and your classes all the time so don't worry about that we've got you covered there um Perfect. all right patrick have you found the, the I, image i found the image yes okay. Tran transitioning okay. over yeah we've got uh there our beautifully bio fluorescent uh swell shark here i'll actually put it even more prominently here in the middle of everything so that people can see it uh, a little bit better so for those of you wondering this is not bioluminescence in terms of the swell shark is not making that green light we're shining a very bright or a very um, blue light, and then we're putting a yellow filter over the camera so that all you're seeing is not the blue light, but the excitation of molecules in the skin that gives you back a different color uh, from the blue. And so some animals use biofluorescence for, uh, for predation or for, for lures or things like that. We actually did a really great talk with uh, Mbari's Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's um, uh, Oh, Steve Haddock uh, had a really amazing talk about bioluminescence, biofluorescence. But when it comes to sharks, it's sort of the same thing as uh, as what you might find in scorpions and crabs, where they are fluorescent, but there's probably not much of a reason for that other than it's a side effect of how they are built up, just how their how their their skin works there. But there's our biofluorescent swell shark right there. We found it. <laughs> we nailed it. Okay, I'm going to go back over to you, Emily. Okay, All you're right. back up there. There I am. Um, another question 
about our swell shark there. Um, that was an awesome photo of our little baby swell sharks. Can you talk about um, the sharks that we have in our exhibits? Do they reproduce? What does that look like? Are they having live babies? Are they laying eggs? We had some folks curious about shark reproduction in chat. Yes, uh, so we do have swell sharks in there. Uh, we only have female swell sharks right now just because the aquarium industry is kind of uh, fully saturated with swell sharks and we <laughs> want to make sure if we do breed anymore, if we get any more babies, we have homes for them. Uh, swell sharks do lay egg cases. Those guys are sometimes nicknamed mermaids purses because when they washed up on the shore, nobody knew what they were and they said, it looks like a mermaid purse, so that's what they went with. <laughs> uh, we do have leopard sharks in there. Uh, I have seen mating behavior, which in sharks is is pretty violent. It looks violent, but that's just the way that they go. Uh, the males usually bite on to those pectoral fins on the side and wrap around the body. Um, so it looks rough, but that's they, they don't have hands either, and they're in the water, so that's what they have to do. Uh, right yeah, on. I have not seen any babies result from our current batch of leopard sharks okay. in chaos. We, uh, I'm putting up on screen now, Kelsey, some of those mermaids purses that uh, some, oh, yeah. some visitors will sometimes see uh, when they come to the aquarium, uh, sort of swaying at the base of the kelp there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, those work? They're up on screen now. Yeah, so if you look, if you're able to look closely enough and you kind of see a round yellow, looks greenish yellow through it, that's the yolk of the of the egg that got laid. So attached to that would be a little teeny tiny baby shark embryo starting to produce. Um, and the egg case is going to protect it from the wild. You also see near the top, there's these little spindles on it. Um, and that is what it, it does. That's a great picture of it for the explanation. Uh, the tendrils get wrapped up a lot of times in the base of kelp. And so they're gonna stay in place, they're gonna get that swaying, they're gonna get the water motion, and they're gonna be protected. And swell sharks, I believe it's about 18 months, but I would have to check that fact, don't quote me on it, 18 month um, gestation period, or egg, inside the egg before they hatch out. And what's cool is that if you have a light or something from behind, you can actually see them start to develop and start to get bigger, and then, um, They'll start to, those little points at each side, kind of, uh, there's a gel in there that will dissolve and they'll get water motion going through the egg. And then when the baby is strong enough and has absorbed all of its yolk, it'll force itself out of one of those times, kind of like a, a tunnel or a tube. And then you got a baby shark in the world. Which is and we all wonderful thing. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing, Emily. And we also know exactly how that song goes right we do we do there's no yeah. yeah yeah there's no need to bring it up everybody no, <laughs> no need to bring it up we no all it up. we all we don't have know. the copyright to that yeah we, yeah not only do we not have the copyright yeah no we don't need that uh to to happen but yeah we all know how it goes everybody no need no I need to type with a, i work with a fair amount of parents and and the kind request is being that we don't sing that song right. at work <laughs> there are certain things, you know, during this time of shelter at home that we can all do to help each other out and not <laughs> not singing baby shark to marine biologists is certainly appreciated. All right. <laughs> okay, back to you, Emily. We I believe uh, we I believe we've got a trooper. Yeah, hi. We've hi, there's Trooper. Hi, oh, I gotta get rid of the icons here so we can get much more of Trooper there up on screen. There's Trooper. <laughs> Everybody in the chat, please say hi to Trooper right now. Oh, oh, what do you think? <laughs> She's our research uh, research pup. She's been the one sending me the images there yes. behind the scenes there. He's taking care of all of the question and answer today. Um, Perfect. <laughs> okay, there we go. Good girl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to working from home. Uh, yeah. No, okay. A great question that we had. Um, that was over there on Facebook. There it is. I just found it again from Sadie. I love this question. Um, is there a good example of commensalism in kelp forests or Ooh. any kind of mutualism there? If you want to talk about those, Kelsey. Dang. Well, the senoritas that we mentioned earlier are a good example of that because they can pick the little parasites off of all the other fish. 
and then the fish get a little bit more parasite free life so that's a really good example of that yeah um, um there's a bunch of uh a it depends, uh, I guess, how far you want to go with uh, with the definition. But there is, of course, sorry, I was just trying to put Trooper up here on on the screen there, oh, and I've I've already she, she's already sat down. She's okay, but the girl. the icon is up there on the screen now. Everybody, can we at least appreciate the technological wizardry <laughs> that it took to do that? Um, okay, now she's back up. Here's Trooper. Yeah, right next to her icon. Perfect. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there are so many organisms where, um, you have animals that are living on top of the giant kelp, for example, uh, where it's, it's their habitat. You have worms and stuff that live in the, um, in the grooves of sea star arms and different things like that. So there's definitely uh, a lot of, you know, there's parasites and symbiosis and all those things there. But I think, uh. Yeah, the best example in terms of the fish or that you might be able to see at the aquarium, like you said, Kelsey, there is definitely the the senoritas being cleaners every so often. Yeah. And it's definitely it's a complete picture. We've got we've got the isopods in there. Yeah. Uh, that's actually something when I mentioned earlier about getting rid of some of the uh, older pieces of kelp. You kind of have to go through it to make sure you don't accidentally put isopods on exhibit where where they don't belong. Right. So they get tossed back in the kelp forest. <laughs> Nice. They've got a good life in that kelp forest exhibit. Those isopods. But isopod, well. I I would say so. That's a pretty pretty sweet gig <laughs> for an isopod. Have your own kelp forest. Okay, That's we're true. back over to you, Emily. Do we have more questions from the folks we out there? We do. We have a, another very important question from Sasha over on YouTube. How is our sheephead doing, Ooh. Kelsey? <laughs> that male sheephead doing great. Doing solid. <laughs> uh, it's a fun fish to swim with. Although um, I was talking earlier about with having newer divers come in, he's that the large male is one that I kind of have to give a heads up to. He doesn't really go after fingers or biting anything unless sometimes if you're trying to feed him and your finger gets in the way. But he's very interested if you are overturning rocks or earlier when I was talking about planting, um, planting the holdfast kelps, a lot of times if you'll do that, you'll, uh, you'll, um, uh, there'll be clams and crabs and stuff that just kind of come up from it and all of a sudden with no warning this big fish will be right here and it's a big fish and it'll sneak up on you and it'll be right there looking and looking straight at your hands and not biting not gonna go for it but if there's a crab that scurries out of the way you better believe that that is the sheep going for. yeah i'm pulling <laughs> i'm pulling our sheep head up on screen right now kelsey that way everyone can really appreciate uh, the glory of this uh, beautiful boy. Uh, oh, they're beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Can you tell us a little bit uh, while I go to find the other image about the life history of the sheephead? Because yes. it is rather interesting. Because So that one yeah. that you show is a male, but actually all sheephead are born females. And when they're younger, they look a lot different. Uh, they're pink. They're a little bit more of a cigar shape. Um, and as they get older, uh, what they do is they've got groups, sometimes also ca actually called harems, and the largest fish in that harem will turn into a male and then will be the male of that population. Um, males are also very territorial, and so we usually only have one male in kelp forest at a time because they might beat each other up too much over in that, in that area. Uh, but we do have females that we keep an eye on uh, they're harder to see because they're kind of that pink color, whereas the males have got that big black and orange stripes with that uh, white jaw underneath. So yeah, they are they're they're fun fish to to work with too. Right on, a Emily. Keep us going here. I I almost have a beautiful collage uh, loaded here of sheephead from the little baby females right. to the mid-sized females <laughs> to the bigger. <laughs> uh males you're, i'll just keep stalling you're doing important work S over there i'm right just now. stalling i'm watching my little wheel <laughs> load it's thinking about it we're almost there all right well we've talked about two animals that are predators of sea urchins so we had someone who was curious are there any sea urchins in the exhibit and if so how do we keep them safe <laughs> There are sea urchins in the exhibit. Uh, there are surprisingly some huge sea urchins in there. Um, 
and it's kind of up to the urchin to keep itself safe. You usually don't see them out and about in like in the middle of the sandy floor or in the middle of the rocks. Um, that's another thing that the sheep head's looking for when you're overturning rocks and all sorts of stuff. Um, we do what we can. If we ever add some, we kind of place them in out of the way spaces. But after that, it's up to the urchin to keep itself safe. Okay, uh, everyone, I just want to now present to you this collage of young female sheephead to mid-sized female sheephead to the male sheephead there. I believe it was worth the wait, but thank you so much, Kelsey and Emily, for all of the explanation. <laughs> oh, yeah. In between, there it is. There's oh, uh, that. a little progression Beautiful, there. Patrick. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the support. Okay, <laughs> back to the experts. Uh, let's see. Let's go over to Emily. Emily, what's, what's the internet wondering? The internet is kind of all over the place. I love all the diversity of questions that's, that are coming in right now, Kelsey, um, because we've been talking a lot about the animals in here and we've been talking about the kelp in here, but we also had folks who were curious about the water that's in here because it's pretty special, right? It is pretty special. We're very lucky with where we're located in that we are able to pull in water from Monterey Bay. We've got uh, to some underwater pipes. The intakes are at about 60 feet below uh, the water level. If anybody is local or wants to look out, you can see two yellow buoys at the top um, signifying where they are. So we're able to bring in that water and all of the, the nutrients, the plankton and all that stuff uh, into exhibit. We do usually run it through sand filters during the day, uh, but overnight it gets that nice nutrient rich water. Now, the reason why we don't have that full on water coming in is that it might make the exhibit too cloudy and you wouldn't be able to see it. The animals would love it, but we are, you know, we do want, we want to enjoy it as well. And especially with webcams going on now, nobody wants to turn on a webcam and just see a mass of green or brown. Um, so we do run those filters during the day. Although sometimes when we've had huge plankton blooms, it happens anyway. We do what we can, and our control department does back flushes on the filters six, seven times a day, but pieces still get in and it gets really cloud foggy. So there's a downside of using uh, water from Monterey Bay. Sometimes you get that, but the benefits definitely are worth it. Right, and uh, now up on the screen here, I've got a photo of some uh, plumose anemones hanging out on those intake pipes with uh actually right behind the logo um the big screen there that keeps things like diving birds or scuba divers themselves sea otters from uh going and investigating the inside of of our pipes there those those big screens you can see the color of the water there is very green compared to the water that we have in the kelp forest where it's filtered there on the left side and that green there on the outside um so uh, this is where folks like yourself, Kelsey, go out diving every so often and go investigate, see what's going on out there. Go look for, go look for what's going on with, with intake pipes. Cause every so often we have, uh, interesting visitors, especially when the jellies happen to be around. I was about to say that. And you think that, you know, the big animals would be the bigger culprits, but it's actually the jellyfish that get that intake pipe into a lot of trouble. There are times when we get a huge jellyfish bloom where you can't even go swimming in the water because they're everywhere. And so many of them, even though it's a screen, they, they'll get sucked to the screen that it actually impacts. And that is a huge screen. I think it's about six feet tall. It's massive. And you look at it when they pull it out to replace it. And it looks like a squashed Coke can from the side, just from the pressure and the jellies. So then we've got to put the aquarium into closed mode and have divers go out and replace the screens and clean the screens and right. some, yeah. Those jelly blooms come. We all we all buckle up and get ready to start repairs. And for those of you wondering what type of jellyfish we are referring to, I now have the sea nettle there up on the screen. So uh, those brown sea nettles that come around every so often uh, that we have on exhibit. Uh, this is a black and white photo. That was the first one that I could find. They're usually brown. Uh, and they're the ones that you see on our jelly cam. So go check out our jelly cam uh, when this is done if you want to see the types of jellies that can bloom and really cause some some problems for us. Uh, yeah. Just means divers have to go diving in that spicy water to go clean things up. 
Oh, and it's rough too. Yeah, it makes it hard to clean up too. Even though you're a neoprene, those tentacles and the staining nematocysts get everywhere. I've had it happen where it's wrapped around the regulator in my oh, mouth. Oh no. And all around my mouth is just staining. My lips, well, they swelled up so big. Yeah, I so. got I got to say that um it it almost smells metallic in a weird way when when it covers your 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 wetsuit. Yeah, not we don't wish that on yeah. too on too many people. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. It's not fun replacing those. Um, but when when you, when the jelly's ruin it, you gotta fix it up. Yep, that's the living bay for us. All right, back yeah. to back to Emily. What are we thinking? We uh, we had a lot of people sympathizing there or, and empathizing with, uh, with you about people the people uh, who have the sea swum with their jellies. They know. They know. They know. They know. <laughs> They know the, the the spicy water that that occurs, as you said, Patrick. Um, all right, back to the questions here. Um, we had a couple of people asking about the giant sea bass and um, how the little one is doing inside the kelp forest. We tend to always talk about the big one. What about the little one that's in? Little there? one is still doing well. Um, this has turned into a bit of a stubborn fish. I think we talked about <laughs> at the prior one. Uh, it can target really well and uh, when it wants to, and it, that's the little asterisk is when it wants to. Uh, there was a dive, I think about two weeks ago, we've got the stretcher and we're working on stretcher training it um, to get it into a stretcher. And before the divers even had um, the targets in the water or the divers were by the water, the fish was already in the stretcher, looking up, ready for food. It knew what to do. Just like wow. a little puppy. Oh, you didn't ask me. I did the trick. I'm good. I'm right here. So he's doing well. And then he gets back into his attitude that he doesn't want to. And he'll just stare at you and stare at the food and want you to feed it without actually doing any of the targeting. So we oh. got to be on top of our game. I, I just tried to put up a, a video there of, of the young uh, giant sea bass, and it looks like I got oh. um, just the leopard shark swimming by uh, right <laughs> behind your head there, trying to do what giant sea bass do. I think I found the right one here. Uh, let's get let's give it a shot. Yeah, those leopard sharks aren't helping the training either. Yeah, here we go. We've got uh, that's the young giant sea bass there that uh, that you were training there with the with the stretcher. It's up on screen now. Oh, I love that little guy. Can you tell us what uh, what the stretcher is for? So sometimes we do have to remove our fish from the salt water, uh, either to do exams on them or to do a freshwater bath. Uh, we were talking about those parasites earlier. There are senoritas in there that can pick off the parasites, uh, but sometimes, so sea bass, a lot of the times, if they don't want to move, they're not moving too often. So they can get a heavier parasite load than other fish. They also have very sensitive eyes and they are sight-based predators. So if um, their eyes get too covered by parasites, um, they won't be able to see. And especially with us target training, they won't be able to see the target uh, to feed. So sometimes what we do is we take them out of the water and we do a freshwater bath essentially, only four minutes. The fish is fine in that time, but the parasites on it aren't fine. Uh, a lot of them can die right away, or some of them just swell up to being in fresh water since they're saltwater parasites and pop off. And then when we put the fish back in the water, it's a much cleaner fish. Um, so we normally, we could go in with nets to net them out. We can go in with the stretcher. But what we wanted to do was to have the fish be calmer throughout the procedure. And actually you can train them to swim into the stretcher on their own. So that's what we've been working on so that when we need to do this procedure, they can swim straight into the stretcher on their own and we can get them out and there's a lot less stress. Um, we're working on it with both of these animals. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point where they can swim to the stretcher all on their own well enough for a procedure, but already they are a lot more relaxed and calm once that stretcher comes out. That's awesome. Yeah. That actually helped to answer a lot of the questions. Oh, there we go. Chat. Kelsey, you're crushing it right now. Oh, a lot of folks wondering about how we can move fish in and out of the exhibits. Those stretchers are a great example of one of the ways that you can take fish from one place to another place. Um, 
but I was just looking at the time. We have about 10 minutes left here. How do you feel about some rapid fire questions? All right, give it to me. And I will try to be rapid this time. I talked <laughs> much about last time. I didn't get enough of them. All right, rapid fire. Rapid All right, fire. rapid fire. How deep does kelp grow? 60 feet. Macrocystis kelp, 60 feet. Bull kelp, venereocystis, 120. Awesome. Nice. All right, next question. Do we know what the oldest fish in our exhibit is and how old is it? It likely would be one of the rockfish. Uh, they can live 100 to 150 years. If we put in an adult rockfish 36 years ago, we have no way of knowing how old it is um, until it dies and we take it out and check the otolith. But easily, we don't know for sure, but I, there's at least a 100-year-old fish in the aquarium somewhere. And can you describe what the otolith is? I think oh, that yeah. could be interesting, yeah. The otolith is a, a bone inside the ear, and it actually, uh, as they grow, if you can take it out and cut it in half, you get growth rings, like around a tree would get growth rings as it old, ages up. And so if you count those rings, you can tell how old the fish is, but you can only do that after the fish passes away. So so we'll hold off until until we have more otoliths. It's a good call. Yes, from them. Good yeah. Call. <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely some uh, some husbandry 101. Don't check the otolith of a fish that you still want around. Yeah. 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 Keep that call. otolith in there. You'll yeah. be much happier. Fish will be better. There you go. Yeah. Pro tip. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, another question that we had, how many different kinds of fish are in the kelp forest? I should have checked the notes. I think we got her. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say 47 different types, but I could be wrong on that one. Okay. Well, I knew okay. I should have checked my notes beforehand. Well, 14 <laughs> different types of rockfish. Emily was right on that one. Ooh. For sure. I got that and it's, one. And it's <laughs> always right. it's always changing too. So uh Oh, we'll, it's always changing, yeah. yeah. And if you ask the actual numbers of fish, I'd say thousands. Uh it's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. right on um this one just came up here um we actually i think this is okay if it's not a rapid fire question for you okay because a lot of people are asking about it right now that we're talking about otoliths mm. a lot of folks very curious about wait fish have ears <laughs> can you talk ah. a little bit more about fish that can hear underwater it's crazy they don't have external ears like we do but they do have internal ears um, and they do have that inner ear bone, the otolith, um, that we can use. Uh, something that, well, I think it's cool, but, um, so sharks have bones made out of cartilage. So previously we had not been able to age a shark because cartilage doesn't hold on to those rings like, like the bones of the bony ear do. But, uh, recently if you take a shark's vertebrae and you can fix it in some chemical i forgot what it is those rings are then more visible so it's Whoa. a different way to do it and it's a bone versus cartilage thing but there's a way to do that now to find out the age of sharks which is how they've been able to age uh like some of the greenland sharks that we thought only lived to 200 years and now they're like 350 years old wow um, so yeah <laughs> science is science is evolving and the more we know the cooler these fish get you know that's excellent it's true we're back to you emily all right back to me we also had a question here um regarding the invertebrates inside mm -hmm. the exhibit we just talked about how many fish species this, this one's gonna be harder kelsey do you know how many invertebrate species hundreds. We have? <laughs> yeah i think yeah just the general hundreds of hundreds them of them that we have if in we're here. including different species of isopods and copepods and worms and clams and hundreds hundreds and hundreds yeah Lots. Lots there you go yeah i mean and that kind of speaks generally to the diversity of life on our planet too that you know for every one vertebrate species we have we have so 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 many more invertebrate species there so it's definitely reflected in the kelp forest yeah and often we can focus too you know not too much on fish because that's me always want to focus on fish but we've got a lot of cool invertebrates going on in there too 
Mm -hmm. um, if you were to walk by really quickly, you might not notice them. But if you really take your time and examine the holdfasts or the rocks or anything, you'll see lots of little critters, lots mm -hmm. of lots of life and interactions going on in there. All right. Another question that we had, where do our fish come from? Uh, most of them come from the Monterey Bay. Uh, most of those fish have grown up. Uh, some of the ones that have been there since we've opened, uh, some of them have grown up throughout our exhibits. Um, sometimes we do go collecting down south in Catalina where there's a higher concentration of baby fish that are in shallower water. And we will grow those animals up uh, through some of our smaller exhibits in kelp zone. And as they get larger, there's different habitat appropriate exhibits that they can go into before going in um, to kelp forest. Uh, when we have rockfish, we can go uh, fishing for them. Uh, we do, we don't have a schooling fish now. Um, with us being closed, we haven't been able to replenish our schooling fish yet. Uh, but we actually buy those from local, from fishermen uh, that sell them as live bait. And so we can go down uh, sometimes here, sometimes San Francisco, sometimes Half Moon Bay, and just buy um, sardines, anchovies, mackerel, depending on what's available and then get those guys into exhibit. Awesome, that actually helped to answer another one, another one of the rapid fire Just questions. On a roll. You're, you're on a roll, yeah, you're doing a great job. Um, well then hopefully uh, maybe this can be kind of our last question of the day here because it, it's a bit of a, a longer one, Kelsey, but okay. I definitely think that it's an important one. Um, the Kelp Forest exhibit is kind of a little slice of the Monterey Bay that we've mm -hmm. taken and put it inside the aquarium to show off the incredible diversity of life that we have just outside our back doors here. What is so important about having a diverse habitat both inside the aquarium and more importantly out in the ocean? What's the point of having all these amazing animals out there? You're right, that's not a quick fire question. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> but it's a very good question and it's one that is at the root of why a lot of us do what we do. Um, I'm a scuba diver and so I've gone out and I've seen this in the wild, but a lot of people have it. And especially when you're a kid, you can't be a scuba diver yet. Um, so by us being able to bring in a piece of that wild, a piece of that kelp forest and show it to people, um, we're able to better educate them. We can get people interested in what's going on. Um, our whole mission of the aquarium is to inspire conservation of the ocean. So by exhibiting these animals, this algae, by doing talks like this, by reaching out to people on social media, hopefully we'll be able to inspire somebody. We'll be able to impart a little bit of knowledge and we'll be able, you know, our, our earth is in trouble. Our oceans are in trouble. There's a lot we can do. Um, there's a lot we're trying to do. Um, I know there's a lot of things going on in the world right now, uh, but oceans have been needing help for a while too. So if we can inspire somebody to help conserve that, to help do something small in their life, um, that will help that action. That's kind of, that's kind of why we, why we do what we do and why we're able to display, um, these, this, this amazing habitat. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I was going to say, I don't think we could have said it better ourselves. No, Kelp, well, thanks. Kelp, Kelpsy knocking Kelpsy. it out of the park there for, yeah. for the ocean. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, I mean, I'm I'm looking at the time down here. I'm going to put the all of us up here up on screen because I think uh, I think we're just about just about there. Fifty nine minutes there uh, with everybody. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for tuning in here. I'll even get rid of our, our icons here. We'll bring Trooper. Oh, no. We OK. Icons are coming back because we got we got Trooper. We got trooper. Yeah. Here. Hold on. Okay. Everybody's there here. I'll move us up. That's what I'll do. That way we got trooper in view. Um, thank you so much everyone for, for tuning in for all of those amazing questions. Uh, before we sign off in the chat, can we get, uh, can we get everyone to give a great big round of applause and thank you to Kelsey for oh, all of the, not only the, the Herculean efforts of keeping the, the exhibit going, but all of that knowledge just then the ocean passion, uh, I mean, just give, give, give a shout out to someone who's trained in sea bass. All right. Like now's your, <laughs> now's your chance to do that. Um, thank you so much everyone for that. Uh, if we can also get a shout out to trooper right here, troopers right there. Hey trooper. Good to see you. 
Um, yeah, there we go. Here, little pets for Trooper. Nice. We did it. Uh, and a shout out to, to Emily as well for um, all of those questions there. And then uh, I already took all of my kudos for the for the sheephead collage. That was that was fine <laughs> art there. We'll take it. Uh, but with that, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon here virtually at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and hopefully very, very soon in person at the Monterey Bay Aquarium as well. Um, Emily, any f final words for us? Uh, just as always, remember to be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, and we look forward to seeing you again soon, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye, everybody.